everybody. Welcome to Around the Paul. It is game week, and tonight we're going to preview Clemson's matchup with the NC State Wolfpack. It's always one of the most compelling games on the ACC slate every year. It's been some great matchups down throughout the years. And for this season, it may be a compelling matchup, but uh, not necessarily in the ways that both teams would like. Uh, it's two teams that have kind of struggled a bit this year, both coming in at four and three overall, and Clemson two and three in the ACC. And so this is a battle of teams that are looking to get on track. And we've got two special guests that are joining us tonight, Justin Grice and Colby Pleasant uh, from a whole pack of Wolves podcast. Guys, welcome in. Glad to have you. Thank you so much for having us, man. Appreciate you. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, what we like to do when we have guests on, uh, we're going to give you guys the floor uh, right out of the gate. Tell us a little bit about NC State this year. Uh, it's a t I know you guys have a team at, at, that's had some frustrations, kind of like we have in Clemson. So, uh, you know, it's two teams that I think, at least on an, um, an emotional level, we can kind of understand each other a little bit here in 2023. Um, yeah, most of these two schools really, I mean, we talked about it last year too. These two schools are really, really very similar. You know, from a academic perspective, I mean, they're both, you know, land grant STEM schools. So, I mean, it's really easy for me to not be that upset with you guys because you guys hate Carolina just as much as we do. We just hate a different Carolina. So, no doubt. Um, but yeah, it's been a struggle for us this year. Um, you know, we've had some games where we were playing really, really well. I mean, we played really well against VMI and then we played really, really well against uh, Marshall as well. But then last week, you know, or we were on the bye week. So two weeks ago, we struggled against Duke. You know, we only put up three points against Duke. So welcome just to the club. <laughs> yeah, welcome to the single digit scoring club against Duke. So who's raise your hand if you would have seen that coming, you know, preseason. Oh. So <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah, no, 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 no. They are a good football team, though, I will say that. No, their defense is really strong, and I I was very impressed by them. Uh, they flowed to the ball very well. But it's just been one of those seasons for us where we haven't really been able to develop any playmakers. Um, Kevin Concepcion is really the only real receiver that we have. And it's just been a, you know, a struggle all year trying to find out who's going to step up next. So I'll let Kobe do some – you know some stuff too what you got um i mean uh like justin said i mean this this team is on offense is just very much underperformed i mean it's just kind of <clears throat> lackadaisical um we were told that this was going to be an explosive air raid offense um robert and i comes from the um mike leach coaching tree um, so, you know, we were going to thought we we're going to be slinging it all over the field and it just really hasn't seemed like that. We know we've struggled to get any offensive consistency. And I mean, it's, it's due to lack of playmakers and, um, mm -hmm. you know, lack of a running game, also lack of a physical offensive line. Um, our offensive line has not done well in the running game. Uh, we've had a lot of false start penalties. Um, just silly penalties on the offensive line. Um, and, I mean, pass protection-wise, our offensive line actually does pretty well. Uh, but just can't get anything on the run game. And then our, our running backs are all solid. I mean, they're averaging pretty good yardage um, once they get a good hole and they, they can go through. Um, and then, I mean, just our receivers just – haven't been there and it, this was supposed to be a team that would involve the tight end a lot and it's just Robert and I just chooses to abuse our tight ends and just not use them at all um, I mean the only time our tight end was even used this season was uh, Trent Penix who is our tight end um, had like two touchdowns for 96 yards against Marshall and granted Marshall, it was a top defense in the league. I think they've gone down a little bit now, but, um, you know, that's – it's still just one game. I mean, we need to – we need to utilize them a lot more. And so it's just offensively we've just been – it's just been frustrating. But our defense has let up some big plays that I feel like as NC State we would like to have back. Um, 
just because mm -hmm. you know our defense for so many years has just been the heart of this team. But you know, hopefully we get get it done with maybe a few uh, Clemson fumbles here and there. Well, Griffin, I tell you what, uh, man, <laughs> An, uh, a team that struggles in the run game thanks to a porous offensive line. Now, where in the world have we heard that story before? <laughs> yeah, that 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 rings a bell <laughs> for for sure. And I, I think looking at these teams, there's they're a little bit identical when it comes to how their offense has worked uh, compared to how their defense has worked. Their defense has kind of been the story of the season, and if mm -hmm. you want to spell any more trouble for Clemson, um, NC State leads the ACC in sacks, which mm -hmm. you know, especially with how the Clemson offensive line performed against Miami last week, is a huge problem. But yep. worst game I'm, ever. <clears throat> exactly. So you could have some trouble in that. You could have a trouble. I I'm not. I I wouldn't take this game lightly, especially being in Raleigh, being at Bryant Denny Stadium. It's a tough place to play. Two years ago, Clemson lost, I think, one of their – I forget how many games they lost last year. Or not last year, two years before that. But I, I wouldn't take this game lightly. NC State, they have, they have players that can help them win this game and should not be overlooked before Notre Dame next week. Yeah, that, that loss was uh, the cigar game. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the infamous Man. Red Solo Cup. <laughs> yeah, so – Yeah, so – yeah, so basically what I see with this game is, like, you know, I, I agree with Griffin. Like, it, it's a battle of the defenses, and, uh, you know, our offensive line is, is terrible. Um, they had their worst game of the season. Um, and the crazy thing is, going into the season, I had really high hopes for this offensive line. And they just have underperformed, <laughs> and – and, you know, we have had a few injuries. Uh, we got a few people out, um, one for the year. And I think that really hurts us um, on the offensive line. But that still doesn't take away from how poorly we played. And that's not an, that's not an excuse for how poorly we played. It's just been, it's just been terrible. And uh, Miami just straight drug us up and down the field um, last week. And I was not expecting that. And, uh, yeah, and then, you know, our offense, you know, the quarterback makes his own play, you know, makes his own call with, at the end of the game. That was just crazy. And, you know, and then we fumbled three times. So um, if that – if you have that type of play, you're definitely going to lose the game. And, you know, if we play like that against, against NC State, uh, that's a loss. We can't win with three turnovers. Yeah, I agree 100%. Uh, and I'll tell you what, Justin and Colby, you know, this is a game that uh, throughout the years, really I think probably starting around 2015, 2016 in that time frame, uh, you know, there's really been no love lost between Clemson and NC State. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, but, you know, I can just say it is what it is. Dave Doran is probably yeah. not um, uh, everyone's uh, favorite opposing coach in Clemson, but uh, – there's been some jabs traded back and forth over the years, and, and uh, the games have gotten a little bit chippy. Mm -hmm. But I don't know that there's really any type of, uh, of uh, meaningful smack talk that either side can levy against the other this year because it's um, and it's two teams that have been dancing with mediocrity, and neither one or, or either team's trying to keep from tripping over their feet. <laughs> totally agree. We, Colby and I were talking about this uh, on our podcast. Both teams in their last 13 games are seven and six. So, yeah. you know, raise your hand if you really would have thought that would have been the scenario coming into this game, too. Because realistically, I mean, you guys are consistent winners. You know, I mean, you guys are consistently winning 10 games a season. And we've been pretty consistent, too. I mean, we've pretty much averaged eight games or eight wins a year for the last five years as well. So, you know, for us, the expectation coming into this season was, you know, Brennan Armstrong was going to repeat 2021. Well, by week six, he wasn't even our quarterback anymore. So, I mean, that tells you how kind of weird our season's gone. So, it's been really a roller coaster, but we're hoping that we can find some kind of offensive consistency. And because ultimately for me, I think – our team especially is going to be playing for next year. You know, I mean, we we got to find some answers going into 2024. 
Yeah, and I think that's the same with Clemson. And uh, Griffin, you know, it's funny. The Tigers can't seem to catch a break here and there. You, you, we've got we got a playmaker back in Antonio Williams against Miami, only for him to get hurt after just two catches again. And uh, so there's a couple of injury issues there. But at the same time, just like Justin talked about uh, with NC State having Concepcion really being the only reliable wide receiver, once again, and it's been the same refrain, there have been some moments where these Clemson wide receivers have looked good. You've gotten some consistent play out of a couple of guys, but it just has not been, once again, an electric unit across the board. So um, does this game in any way, does it maybe not come down to, but is a key part of this game which wide receiver core will step up and play the best? I'd have to agree with that because, because like, like mm-hmm. you guys have said, this is going to be a defensive battle. And honestly, if – if it comes down to two wide receivers, it's going to be the freshman. It's going to be Tyler Brown on Clemson side, and it's going to be Kevin Conception on NC State side. That's mm-hmm. kind of how it's going to go. And I, I think for NC State, like for Clemson, the bye week was kind of a – it was it, it didn't turn out to be well. An extra week did not help out, especially from the result last week. The bye week might help NC State, obviously, because a new quarterback with MJ Morris, you're developing more chemistry with receivers – it could be a blessing in disguise for sure. Having extra days of practice, extra days of rest could help a lot. So for me, mm-hmm. I'd I have to agree with that. You're going to go, I think this game goes down to the wire. I think it's a one score game, uh, very low scoring, but you know, I, I would think the talent of Clemson would come out on top. I could be completely wrong, but because we've been wrong many times before on this podcast, when it comes to Clemson football, <laughs> <laughs> but you you never you never know in situations like this. For me, for me, I think it's you know it's going to be which which wide receiver shines, and which defense gets the last stop. That's how that's whoever's going to win this game is going to win. Yeah, yep. I, I would agree with that, uh, guys. We talked a little bit about it too. I think NC State's kind of had some trouble. They haven't had any real trouble like getting turnovers. The problem for us has been really getting points off of turnovers. So, you know, I even go back to the Notre Dame game Colby and I were at. It was 24 to 17 going into the fourth quarter, and we just forced a fumble at Notre Dame's 13 yard line. So, I mean, we were literally just 13 yards away from tying the football game up. You know, very next drive, we don't get any points off of it. You miss a field goal, you know, and that just completely turns the entire game around, you know, two two interceptions later, they're getting two touchdowns on the board. So I, we talked a little bit about it. I think it's going to come down to, just like Griffin said, I completely agree. I think it's going to be a defensive battle. It's going to be a one-score game. And I think it's going to be who doesn't beat themselves because the biggest trend I've noticed in both of our teams is we tend to really beat ourselves a lot and in different ways. Like ours is way more drop passes and penalties and with Clemson, it's more turnovers. So I think it's going to be who doesn't hurt themselves the most in this game. Yeah, Dabo's, Dabo's always said, you know, don't let Clemson beat Clemson. Mm-hmm. And that's right. what's happened. That's what's happened this year. Clemson has beaten Clemson. Except I will say this, even though we turned the ball over three times, except for Miami, Clemson has beaten Clemson. Because before last game, and, and I continued to say this, we were three plays away from being undefeated. Three or four plays away from being undefeated until last game. And, yeah, and, and I don't think you can say that anymore. And it's something that Dabo, mm-hmm. what, what, I you mean, can. It was his favorite line in, in uh, press conferences up until last week. Well, we're two, three plays away from being undefeated and nobody's talking about this. Well, you know what? You can't use that excuse anymore. Just throwing this stat out there, Clemson has 10 lost fumbles on the season. That is not just worse in the worst in the ACC. That is the worst mark in the entire country. Wow. <laughs> wow. Sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Clemson leads the country in lost fumbles. Wow. I even, and I, I, I didn't would know that. I, that changed my mind now. <laughs> yeah, I would love to know how many of those fumbles um were scooping scores. Or mm-hmm. Or scoops and gave them really good field position to score a touchdown. Because well, uh, that's well, one thing I will say is for you guys um, is if we fumble, we're going to give you great field position. Mm-hmm. So, 
not only that momentum, it's huge, especially in a defensive yeah. battle that we're talking about. It, you're, it's going to be a momentum shift. I can tell you right now, if it's Peyton Wilson that scoops that fumble, you're not catching him. He is so fast. He well, is- guys. I'll tell you, it wasn't a scoop and score. I don't know if you got to watch any of the uh, the game from Saturday at Miami. But the, yeah. our drive of the game, Will Shipley fumbles inside the one-yard line, going in for the mm-hmm. touchdown. And it wasn't a scoop and score. All Miami did uh, against uh, – uh, really, Clemson has a really good defensive line. Well, he mm-hmm. fumbles it inside the one on the very next play. Miami runs it 98 yards right up the middle. Four touchdowns. Oh, no. No, they got that fumble in the end. They got that fumble in the end zone. It was in the end zone. So, mm-hmm. Somebody corrected us in our comments the other day. Okay, Garrett, mm-hmm. <laughs> the listeners corrected us. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it, it, yeah. It they, was crazy, okay, so though. they went eighty yards right up the middle. So, but but the same thing. Yeah. But it's uh, the the thought the is still thing. there. You you fumble the ball away, and on the very next play. Running back goes 80 yards right up the middle. And the irony of all that is the Miami running back himself fumbled the ball at the one-yard oh, line. One yard line. Yeah. And yeah. they one recovered yard. their own fumble. Go figure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wait, so, like, did he, so, like, he dropped it and then, like, recovered it and ran it in? Yeah, I think the, the receiver ball, recovered sorry, it. The Miami running back, he, yeah. he, he takes off the from the middle. He's about to score on oh uh, uh, one play after the fumble. And our DB, he's running up – or our guy's running up behind him. Punches the ball out. The, the ball's fumbled as he's going into the end zone. And we had three guys all around to recover the ball. And somehow one Miami player was able to beat three of our guys to that football, recovered it in the end zone for the first touchdown of the ball game. Oh, wow. my. Oh, my. So that's our luck. I mean, that, that's how things have been going this year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. For, for yeah. us, it's been the penalties. Like – Colby and I were talking about this on our our show the last time. Like, you look at the stats against the Duke game, and we realistically won that game for the majority oh, of it. Yeah, but the well, only yeah. – mm, the biggest, you know, bugaboo we saw was the penalties. And it was like every drive we had, dead. You know, we'd get two false starts in the same drive, and now it's first and 20. So It's like our old linemen looked at the ref wrong, and it just – False start. Yeah. Holding. It was, it was, yeah, if we had a play that we would continue a drive penalty or a hold something, that would just kill it. And we just can't afford to have that. You know, our margin for error is so small, and we just cannot afford to beat ourselves. you know. And it's weird because you guys, I hear, and I talk to so many Clemson fans, you know, because a lot of us are really good friends for the most part, you know, outside of this. But you really hear a lot of the coaches say the exact same things from our teams. You know, it's like, don't beat yourself. You know, we want to play a really clean football game. And then Dave comes out this week and he said, you know, we're trying to play to win now instead of playing not to lose. And I'm like, well, Dave, you've been here 11 years, and that's your whole mantra is playing not to lose, and then you end up losing games that you shouldn't. So we're going to see if they have any changes. I mean, we've made changes on the O-line, so we we put a freshman um, out at left or right tackle now, so that's going to probably be something for you guys to watch. Um, he's a little undersized, but he's super talented. So, Jacarius Peak's going to get his first start uh, this yeah. week. So, he's been playing, but he's just been playing at tight end instead of playing at his actual natural position at tackle. So, you know, we just don't really have anybody that's been really good in halfback pass protection, too. So, we've just kind of been using him as like an extra blocker in, in passing downs, which has hurt us. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, most teams are going to say – you know, hey, he's lined up in the backfield. It's probably going to be a pass play. So, you know, we've just been too predictable. I mean, we've been too predictable, and it's been a tough season. But hopefully for both of our teams, you know, they get right. You know, hopefully this is a get-right team. And if, you know, obviously somebody's going to lose, but hopefully both of these offenses kind of get their ship steered in the right direction. Yeah. Right. Well, I want to talk about, uh, you know, some position group matchups uh, in, in this game and where uh, both teams stack up. 
uh, and some of the position groups. But before we get into that, we do want to give a shout out to our sponsor, Arden's Burger Grill at 1280 18 Mile Road in Central South Carolina. They are your one-stop shop for all of your game day food needs, including their famous double dip wings. They're absolutely fantastic. They've also got mouth-watering burgers, sizzling grills, and they take good care of us. We appreciate their support. So stop by and support them as well. Arden's Burger Grill at 1280 18 Mile Road in Central South Carolina and tell them the crew from around the Paul sent you. Now, some of the position matchups in this ball game, and I want to go back because we talked earlier about the running backs and the, or the lack of a running game with both teams struggling along the offensive line. So, um, it, you know, Griffin, um, I, I'm curious to see – how Clemson's able to do running the ball against a good NC State defensive front that, like you said, leads the ACC in sacks. Um, again, I think it could be a matter as well of which team's able to run the ball most effectively. But where do you see the running backs? Mm -hmm. I it, it's tough, right? Because we because Cl Clifton Garrett, we we talked last last episode about the use of Phil Maffa, Will Shipley, the whole the whole thing. On paper, Clemson has the more talented running back room. When you, mm -hmm. when you put him in the game, that is a completely different story just because of how it has turned out. Right. Both teams are in the, the bottom half. <laughs> yeah, both teams are in the bottom half of the ACC when it comes to rushing yards. Um, mm -hmm. but if, if you're Clemson, you just can't do any silly stuff. You just have to find the hole, run run it, gain yards first, try to get the first downs. So I, I, I personally think the passing game is going to be a little bit more – prevalent in this game mm -hmm. I, I don't i don't think the running game is going to be as big as an impact as some may think i think it's a more of a passing battle especially down the wire but i mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't be surprised if there were you know two or three rushing plays on either side that were four ten yards but if i'm clemson i want to see phil moffa getting the ball more i i've i've been high on him all year i think that he's underused i think that he's underrated if you give him the ball and put it put aside the whole duke situation of him fumbling the ball at the goal line, I think that you're going to get, you're going to be satisfied with what he can bring. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you, Griffin. Like, I, I really feel like Maffa, Ma, Maffa should get the ball more. Um, I don't know. Here's, here's the thing that frustrates me, right? He does, he hasn't in the, in the last, what is it, six games, seven games, he hasn't gotten the ball that much, I feel like. And it's almost like he's done something wrong. And then when they let him back in, they only let him have like one or two plays and then they take him out for the rest of the game. But I definitely want to see him more, especially inside the 10 yard line. Like I know that Will Shipley is the leader and he's vocal. And I think Maffa is a more bruiser back and he has a better chance of not fumbling. I mean, Will Shipley's shown that he fumbles the ball inside the one yard line. I mean, it's proven fact. And why not put Maffa in there or, you know, number 20, put him in there. Um, Dominique Thomas. Yeah, Dominique Thomas, put him in there on the one on the one yard line. Do something. Like, I, I feel like Will Shipley gets the most, um, like, he, he does the most things wrong. But, yeah, he's like, oh, it's okay. Pat him on the back and just throw him back out there. Like. Put somebody else in. Give somebody else a shot inside the 10-yard line. Yeah, Justin, Colby, th this has been uh, really a point of contention for us this year. And, and it's been so many times. It seems like, and to piggyback off what you, you said, Clifton, it seems like Phil Moffa is still being punished for the one fumble in the game in the season opener. But we mm -hmm. find it inconceivable, guys, that you have first and goal inside the one-yard line, inside the one-yard line and double overtime at Miami. And Phil Moffa, who is 6'1", 235 pounds, does not get a single touch in four plays with the ball inside the one-yard line, especially given Shipley's fumble problems. Uh, to, to us, that is just inconceivable. But uh, uh, not sure how you guys view your running back situation uh, or, or the splits with the carries between those guys, but – it's just – it's been incredibly frustrating for us here at Clemson. Go ahead, Cole. So, 
with the three running backs we utilize, I mean, going into the season, we thought that we were going to utilize Michael Allen, Jordan Houston, and Delbert Mims were going to be the three backs that we utilize. Well, Jordan Houston left the team right after, was it Notre Dame, Justin? It was the very next week. Yeah, like right before the VMI game. Right before VMI. Yeah, so – Jordan Houston left the team. I mean, he, he decided that he was going to redshirt the rest of the season and then transfer. Um, all power to him. He has been a running back that has been here since 2019. Um, he got a lot of playing time his freshman year and just really just couldn't – he was behind, I mean, Ricky Person and Bam Knight, uh, who are – if people don't know this, Donovan Bam Knight is now – uh, second string running back for the Detroit Lions. And then Ricky Peer- Person just won a uh, USFL championship with, um, I forget what team he's with, but um, he just won the championship for the USFL. So um, they're both stud running backs. And, you know, J- Jordan Houston just never could have got playing time. And then last year, he just wasn't effective. Michael Allen, a freshman, just – destroyed him when it came to getting carries um and so and then we thought with michael allen being here as a sophomore he would be more productive and it just it seems like he's gotten slower um he just seems like he's also you know he doesn't have that burst that he had as a freshman and it's we think it's because he's putting on weight you know he's putting on trying to put on a little bit more weight so he's more of a bruiser um you know he's able to um, kind of pass block and hold some of these um, guys at bay for the pass block. And it just, it hasn't been, he's a horrible pass blocker and he just doesn't have that burst that he used to have. And then with Delbert Mims, I mean, we use Delbert Mims for goal line at, or third down. That's what he's used for. If he's used for first or second, it's rare and if it does happen, then, like, I don't know what to expect because he's not – he is not that type of back. He is a third down back or a goal line back. He's just big, you know. He's just going to come in there and just run right through you. Um, but now with this year, it's mainly Michael Allen, Delbert Mims, and our freshman, Kendrick Raphael, who is extremely explosive. Um, when Raphael has been in the game – he has just been nothing but explosive. And he really had a coming out party um, against BMI. Granted, it's BMI, but, you know, as a freshman making your first kind of start at running back and you're having a solid game, you actually – he led us in rushing that game. I mean, that's pretty good, uh, if you ask me. And, you know, we haven't seen a good running back since Bam Knight, so – it's just – it's good to have John, uh, Kendrick Raphael back there to, you know, give us a little bit of a spark. But it's mainly him and um, Michael Allen that are, are being utilized the most. Dubber Mims, like I said, is a third down and a goal line back. So, I mean, Justin, if you want any more input, I feel like I explained it really. Yeah, you pretty much hit the nail on the head. I mean, I, I think the biggest thing that we are running into is the same issue that you guys are. We just don't give them enough touches. You know, we we did the we did that against Marshall. We you score forty eight points, and then you turn around against Duke, and you just don't give them enough carries at all. I mean, MJ Morris was our leading rusher again in that game too. So, our biggest problem right now is is really getting the ball in the hands of our playmakers. I mean, we have playmakers. We just don't really get them, get the ball in the hands of the right ones right now. In my opinion, that's what I think we're struggling at the most. I think Julian Gray, we've used him out of the backfield some too. We've used uh, Kevin Concepcion out of the backfield too sometimes. So you guys may want to look out for that too. Um, He does get some carries. So I think it's just a matter of just trying to find out, you know, how quickly can we get the ball in the hands of the guys that are going to do the hard, the heavy lifting? So it's been it's been one of those years where I felt like they should get more carries. If you you know you listen to us, we'll tell you that we should run the football more and more. I mean that's what gets our offense going. 
Yeah, I would agree with all of that. And another position group I want to uh, want to kind of break down, and I think it's one that could uh, really play a critical part in this game and uh, kind of dictate maybe who comes out on top in the end. And we've talked about the receivers for both teams and how the passing – it could be more of a passing game on the offensive side rather than who has more success running the ball. Well, let's talk secondaries uh, for either side. If the passing game is going to be a critical factor, then – how do the how does each team secondary stand up? I know I think I can speak for Clemson, uh, Griffin, and Clifton. I'm very confident uh, in the Tigers secondary. I think Nate Wiggins has been yep. very very good this year. Sheridan Jones has been good. Andrew Makuba, Khalil Barnes, the true freshman. Um, you know, if there's been any part of the team that I think has been a steady constant and has been very very good right from the beginning, it's the back end on defense. I mm -hmm. I have to agree with that. I. I was a little bit, uh, especially last week with Nate Wiggins, he was coming back from injury, so there was a lot a lot more balls thrown to him. But I expect him to do um, go back to his kind of like his early season form, especially against Florida State, where he was able to, for the most part, shut down, you know, Keon Coleman and Johnny Wilson to the best of his ability. But um, that that the secondary, um, and I keep saying this because um, it's a complete flip flop from last year. The secondary might be one of the most um, might be the position group that I'm most confident in, just be just because they are experienced. Um, everybody's back. Everybody's relatively healthy. Um, I'll knock on wood there, but I'm I'm pretty I'm very confident in the in the secondary, and especially with um, with your with NC State's guy Kevin Conception. I think if if Clemson is able to hold him hold him well, I think that you're looking at a good uh, good outlook for the game on Saturday. Yeah, I, th I think Nate Wiggins is probably one of the best, if not the best, defensive cornerback in the nation. I mean, he was terrible last year, you know, and then came on. He was terrible uh, in the NC State game last year and then came on you know, as the year got better, and then he's just been a hoss this year. Yeah. And yeah. um, and really knocked down passes that I was like, can he even get to that ball? And then he does, and um, and you're like, wow. Um, there's two that I can remember specifically. One of them was in the uh, Florida State game toward the end of the game when he got hurt, and then the other one was in the Miami game. When he went up and tipped that ball, I think it was in the first half, um, and tipped that ball, and um, it was incomplete. And I'm just like, wow, like dude's got some hops. Um, and then you got Toriano Pride on the other side, along with uh, you know Jaden Lucas. I think behind him, if he's if he's uh, doing okay. And uh, so, I mean, I think we're doing good. And then you got Makuba. As at safety, um, yeah, and you got Khalil Barnes. I mean, one of the best in the country, I think. Yeah. So, Justin, Kobe, uh, how would you say? Uh, you know, how do you feel about your secondary? Uh, how confident are Wolfpack fans of the back end of that defense? And um, you, you know, who has the favorable matchup in your eyes uh, in that area Saturday? I'm going to take this one because I'm going to absolutely take this opportunity to say that I feel like I was completely wrong when I did our first preview podcast of the season. Um, I literally said that I felt like NC State secondary was going to be the best in the entire nation. And obviously they've had – they've dealt with injuries in the safeties, but realistically it's been underperforming, not necessarily from Aiden White's perspective because most teams just really don't throw his way. But Colby and I, we watched the games together, and it's like, you know, who was that big play that they just completed that pass against? Oh, it's Shaheen Battle. You know, it's like every time we say it's another 20-yard pass play, it's against Shaheen Battle. And he shouldn't be that. I mean, he's a senior, so it's his – you know, he's been in this defense for four and a half years now. So we just kind of overestimated them a little bit this season. I think they have an advantage – you know, when it comes to that, he just hasn't really been, you know, what we expected him to be. Aiden just doesn't really get a lot of balls thrown his way. I mean, he just hasn't really had a lot of opportunities because he was all ACC first team last year. So, he, you know, teams are shying away from him um, this year. But 
if I had to say, I would say you guys are probably going to have the advantage there. Um, I think the only thing Colby and I talked about it was I think we're going to have to end up outsmarting Clemson instead of out talenting Clemson. And I think it's going to come down to, you know, we've got to come up with some creative play calling to try to get maybe Clemson's eyes in the backfield and then end up going over the top of them. I think that's the only real way we're going to be able to beat those those DBs. Yeah, and very quickly, uh, before we move on and uh, end tonight with some predictions for the game, uh, quarterback battle, who's got the advantage there? Is it Cade Klubnick or is it Brennan Armstrong? Because you've got a quarterback in Klubnick who has looked really good throwing the ball at times and, and has made some tremendous passes, but at times has been turnover prone and, and prone to going rogue. But we talked about that on our last video and uh, – um, uh, how for whatever reason he was sowing his own oats and just decided he was going to blatantly ignore a play call that maybe uh, it could be argued cost us the game at Miami. So uh, uh, does the good Cade Klubnik show up and, and does he take center stage or does Brennan Armstrong have the upper hand? Uh, guys, what do you think? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll kick this one off. I, I don't – well, because – uh, and I'll, I'll ask you guys this. I don't know if it's Brennan Armstrong at that QB or if it's, it's MJ Morris. It's MJ Morris, right? Yeah, MJ it's Morris. MJ Morris. Morris. It's, it's, it's okay. MJ season. It's MJ season now. <laughs> yeah, I um, I I I probably have to go with Caden in the quarterback battle just because uh, I believe MJ is a is a freshman. If I'm if I'm correct, sophomore. um, so there is a sophomore. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so there's plenty to learn from both. I'm just going to give the edge to K just because he's had more games under his belt. Um, is the awareness going to be there potentially? Um, that's, that's more of a 50, 50 question. Um, that's, that's just strictly because NC state does have a durable defense. It is a very hostile environment. He hasn't, Kate has not have a host has not had a hostile environment since Syracuse. If you want to ca count Syracuse or Duke. Um, but I'm just going to give the edge to K just because he has more of the experience under his belt, but of course, you know, he could be outperformed on Saturday, which I would not be surprised by if that does happen. Yeah, I, I'm kind of right there with you. Um, it's 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 all about who, which cage shows up. Is it going to be, and is he going to be the one that, you know, fumbles the handoff to um, Will Shipley or, you know, can't make up his mind is he gonna have is he gonna be accurate in his passes um you know or you know is he gonna go rogue and um mm -hmm. so and he does have more experience so um and let me ask y'all this does mj morris what's his arm like i, I think i heard you talk about this does Very, he have a pretty good arm yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what i thought he's, so vertically he's vertically he's probably 10 times better than Brennan Armstrong. Like, I mean, yeah. if, he, if he's That's throwing I, a vertical ball, it's nine times out of 10, it's either get completed or something's going to get called. Because his, his, yeah, he's, he's either getting it right to the receiver or it's um, it's a touchdown. <laughs> like, he's very yeah, good at so, vertical ball. So my my prediction still still K because of the experience. But mm -hmm. yeah, I think this. I think on the offensive side of the ball, it's going to come down to the offensive line, and can Cade put it on the money? Because if MJ's putting it on the money, then um, and Cade's not, then you're in trouble. We're in trouble. So that's kind of where I see it. You know, I'm a stats guy, right? So most of you guys haven't know that. So the stats are going to tell you that it's in Kate's favor. I mean, I I didn't really know much about him until you know we started researching this game. But realistically, Kate Kate has not had a bad year. I mean, he's over 1600 yards passing. He's got 13 touchdowns, only three interceptions. So, I mean, if you're an ACC quarterback in your what tenth game this week, I would say he's had a pretty good good career so far you know I mean both quarterbacks started out really hot MJ had seven touchdowns last year and only one pick started out really rusty in his first start against Marshall he threw three interceptions in that game but also threw four touchdown passes too so he's he's really kind of shaking some of the rust off because we just kind of inserted him you know for two games ago so I really think both of them are extremely talented you know, obviously they both came out from the same quarterback class. So, and we recruited Cade 
very hard when Tim Beck was still here, um, you know, as our offensive coordinator. So if there's one thing Tim Beck does know, it is quarterbacks. And so I know he really did want Cade and he really wanted um, that kid here. But, you know, unfortunately, we ended up settling, if you want to air quote it, settling for MJ. And he's worked out really, really well for us, too. I mean, he's still super talented, too. Um, he's out of Carrollton High School, too, in Georgia. So it's another good, strong Georgia powerhouse for high school football team. So, um, And they won their state championship, too. So he's he's talented. He just doesn't have the experience. I think it's like Cliff said, I think Cade's got the experience on him, and I think it shows a little bit. Yeah. He's also – MJ's also like four and one at home um, mm -hmm. as a starter. Um, so he's got a positive record. Um, and the only loss that he took at home was a Boston College game last year. That was just weird. Yeah, like, he got he, hurt he in that got, game too. Yeah, he got hurt and was out for the rest of the year. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it just, you know, he's, he's an iffy quarterback. I, of course, I'm going to be biased because I, I like the guy. Um, I think he's um, got a lot of talent. Um, Klovnik's pretty good, too, but I, I'll, I'll probably go with MJ. All right, guys. Well, it's that time. Let's throw out some predictions for this one. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll let everybody flip a coin or rock, paper, scissors, uh, whichever uh, whichever thinks uh, think gives you the best odds. Uh, but who wants to go first? Um, I'll start. Uh, we'll, we'll just go down the line, I guess. I Very low scoring, like I said. It's going to be go down to the wire. I have it 14-13 Clemson. I think the def defense gets a stop. Oh. Yeah. Holy I, cow. I think it's low. I think it's very, very low scoring. And I, I'll, I'll ship it. I'll ship it in Clemson's favor. Plus, it is, it is away from home, which is very, very, very tough to play, as you've known from previous years past. I'm going to go 14-13. Maybe a little bit lower than y'all would think. But I see a defensive battle. Yeah, I'm there with you, but I'm a little higher in score because I, I, um, I'm praying that we score more points than 14. But I'm gonna go one more. I'm gonna go two more touchdowns, and I'm gonna say the first, first team to 28 will uh, win this ball game. So I'm gonna go 28-21. You got Clemson, Clemson in that one, Cliff? Clemson. Okay, I got you. Yeah, Clemson. <laughs> yeah. So Colby, I'm gonna let you take our side first. I know we will trying to go down the line, but I want you to go first and I'm going to come behind you. Well, you know what I'm going with, but <laughs> right. uh, Got 31 to. to 20 state. He, he's a little more bullish on on them than I am. I, I'm totally in line with Griffin on this one. I think it's going to be a really big defensive battle, and I think it's going to come down to one, either who has the last possession or – who turns the football over less, but I ended up picking state 17, 13 in this one too. All right. Well, um, it, you know, I'm kind of uh, right there with Griffin uh, and Justin that I think it's uh, probably a low scoring ball game. <clears throat> I'm going to go a little bit higher scoring than Griffin. And, um, you know, I think I, to me, I think Clemson's going to take a, a touchdown lead into the fourth quarter. And I do think that the Tigers' defense will find a way uh, to get some stops, unlike they did against Miami. And Jonathan Whites, who had uh, his best game after coming out of kicking retirement, uh, he, he was getting ready to, be, to start a job as a stockbroker when he was called into action earlier this year. But uh, he had struggled a little bit. Well, he went two for two on extra points and two for two on field goals against Miami. Jonathan Weitz is going to make another big kick to ice it in the fourth quarter. You know, when the opening line came out on this game, I think it was Clemson as a 10-point favorite. So I'm going to fall right in line with the uh, with the official Vegas odds. Clemson 24, NC State 14. All right. Cool. Wouldn't this be a weird game that – we obviously went down to Clemson and lost on a Kyle Bambard missed field goal <laughs> and then almost lost it again from a Lou Groza award winner misses a 32 yard field goal in 2021 to send it to overtime. Wouldn't it be weird if this game comes down to a field goal by one or the other schools? I would not be surprised. <laughs> well, I wouldn't just, be surprised Justin, either. Not at all. <laughs> Justin, I've got to tell you this. Uh, I, I remember the uh, 2016 game with Kyle Bambard very well. Of course, Wayne Gallman got knocked out with the concussion on uh, Clemson's first drive. 
And, and I'll tell you what, when Bambard lined up for that last kick, a 33-yarder from straight down the pipe, I didn't think there was any way he was going to miss it. Um, I can tell you I was in uh, my living room, and I was down on my knees uh, with, with my hands clasped, and, and I'm not Catholic. I'm a, I'm a Southern Baptist born and bred, but I am not ashamed to say that I said a few Hail Marys before he, before that ball was snapped. <laughs> uh, I know that was so heartbreaking for you guys, but uh, I tell you what, I, I lost years off of my life during that game. <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> We did as well. We were sitting actually, oddly enough, uh, Dabo's wife and Devin Leary's mom were sitting together um, at the game in 2021. And me personally, I was the opposite in 2021. You're like, oh, my God, Chris Dunn, he's the leading ACC's leading point getter. Like, we're not even going to remotely have an issue with this. And then all of a sudden, that's his only missed field goal for the entire season. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so year is missed field goal all year it was a 35 yard i believe this one was against clemson i'm like dear god can we just please not have any heartbreaking <laughs> losses again yeah but we won in overtime so it, it didn't matter. yeah luckily you got the win in overtime for that one so i i can easily see this game coming down to a specialist one way or another yep yeah i can too well, it's going to be a great game Saturday, and, um, it, you know, good luck. May the best team win. Uh, but before we wrap up tonight, just want to say one more time, thank you to our sponsor, Arden's Burger Grill, 1280, 18 Mile Road Central. Go check those guys out, and we appreciate them. And um, we appreciate you, Justin Grice and Colby Pleasance uh, from uh, A Whole Lot of Wolves uh, podcast, right, coming on and uh, helping us out tonight. Uh, you know, for all of our listeners and watchers, go check those guys out. If you want some good NC State perspective, guys, we appreciate you coming on. Absolutely. I'm going to give a special shout out to Arden's today, too, just because I actually had the double dipped wings today at SoCon Media Day. So definitely for all of you guys that are in the area, go check them out. They are some phenomenally good food. I'm just going to say that right now. Yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah, um, uh, they take good care of us on game days, that's for sure. Yep, for sure. Well, thank, right, well, thank you guys luck. so much. Yeah, absolutely. It was a pleasure. And, uh, hey, good luck on Saturday. Uh, may the best team win. And uh, either way, I'm sure we'll all come away with a few gray hairs no matter which way it goes. <laughs> so, uh, absolutely. You know, at, le at least for myself and Griffin and Clifton, uh, as we always say, go Tigers. I know you're going to say go, go Tigers. Tigers. Yeah, let's go pack. Go Tigers. <laughs> well, everybody, we appreciate you watching us in this episode and uh, hope it sheds some in, uh, insight on this matchup between Clemson and NC State. But until next time, we're around the Paul, Garrett Mitchell, Griffin Barfield, Clifton Kennedy, and our guest tonight, Justin and Colby, signing off. Good. So long, everybody.